This is the twelfth in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In this lecture, we want to get Lie groups to act on manifolds. We want to examine how the action can be expressed in terms of vector fields on the manifolds. Suppose we have a, a Lie group G acting on a manifold M. Let's see if we can give rise to a vector field on M out of somehow out of this action. And so if we take any element in the Lie algebra um, of the group G, and we consider the associated exponential, um, the one parameter subgroup, that's a subgroup inside G. Um, but of course, since every element of G acts on the manifold M, the action of G on M, uh, we can consider the, the action on some particular element. So we take some M naught, M naught, point of M, and we act on it. Now we can ask, how fast does it move when we do this acting? So we take the derivative at t equals 0 of that expression and see how it mo moves. And we call that by the name, call that uh, the vector field. And I'll use the notation that that'll be a vector field, which has a little arrow going this way, evaluated at m naught. This isn't the right invariant vector field anymore on the Lie group. This is a new vector field. This is on the manifold m because it's the velocity of this point as it moves. So this is a vector field on the manifold M. So when a group acts on a manifold, a Lie group acts on a manifold, um, its one parameter subgroups then act on the manifold. And we can ask how quickly they act. We can differentiate the action uh, in time t and find a, a vector field uh, coming out. So that's the vector field we want to examine. Let's see if we can work it out in simple examples. Um, so let's just work out um, um, first an abstract example, but an important one. Um, if uh, we take M to be G itself, uh, then G acts on itself by uh, left translations. Um, left translations. Um, so uh, then, then in fact, uh, we can calculate uh, that um, the vector field, this vector field, is the same old vector field we had before, the right invariant vector field. Because the right invariant vector fields generate the left action, and the left invariant vector fields generate the right action. So um, so this is why it's not, not the left invariant, but the right invariant vector field that generates the left translations. Um, and, and, and if we look at how that works, we go back to the right invariant vector fields and we calculate their flows. And we found the flow, previously we found the flow of the right invariant vector field through a point was exactly given by the exponential uh, multiplied by that point. This being the exponential in the, in the group, and this is the flow of this vector field on the group. Um, and of course, if we'd used the other direction, if we'd gone with the left translations to the right translation, it wouldn't have worked. Um, we find that uh, the left translation, the, the, sorry, the left invariant vector field um, generates the, the translation on the other side. Um, so one other reason for using the arrows pointing this way to say which side you're multiplying on, the arrow points this way to say which side it's multiplying on. This is the flow of this vector field through this point, and it's not given by multiplying by the exponential on this side, but on that side. So this is why we uh, find that these vector fields should be the, the written with a right invariant vector field notation rather than the left invariant one. It also explains why, um, in general, not just in this example, but in all examples, the bracket of the vector fields um, on any manifold, any manifold M, any group action, the, the brackets don't turn out to be quite what you expect. They always have a funny minus sign, which comes from being the, the, the being related to the right invariant rather than the left invariant story. So that's why you get this funny little minus sign here. But that's that's a rather abstract example. It would be nice to have a more concrete one where we actually compute vector fields, with which which you can really write down. Um, let's consider our favorite example always is the general linear group, because we know that almost all of our examples, well, pretty much all of our examples, are, are actually subgroups inside here. Um, so once we understand what's happening here, we understand pretty much what's happening in all of our other examples. And what does this guy act on? Well, it acts, it's groups of, it's, it's invertible matrices, so it acts as matrices act on the manifold being just 
vectors, the set of all n component vectors, n by n matrices, right? These are n by n vertible matrices. These are just vectors. And so we have the obvious operation, which is that an element in the group is just a matrix, and an element in the manifold, um, in the manifold M here, which is vectors, is a vector. And so uh, the operation is just matrix multiplication times vector, matrix times vector multiplication in the usual sense. Um, so there's nothing mysterious there. We're just doing linear algebra. Um, um, we can then ask, what is this um, vector field? What's the vector field corresponding to some matrix? So we pick A in the Lie algebra, which remember is all n by n, those n by n matrices. Um, so all of the n by n matrices, that forms the Lie algebra under usual uh, bracket of matrices. And how do we construct this vector field? Well, the definition was simply that uh, this guy at any vector x should be the um, rate at which this thing moves of e to the t a x. So, um, so we ask how quickly the the one parameter subgroup moves the point, and that one parameter subgroup is just the actual exponential, the usual matrix exponential. We expand out the exponential function, in this case with a matrix entry, around the around t equals zero, around the identity matrix, around well, around the zero uh, being plugged in for the exponent exponent. 1 plus t a plus dot 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 x. And when we differentiate and set t to 0, of course, we just get a x. So we can sum that up by saying that for um, in linear algebra, the um, action of invertible matrices on vectors, when we differentiate it, gives us an action of, uh, of gives us vector fields who, which are simply described as the vector field associated to a matrix A at each point x is just a x. So plug a, take a vector x, plug it in to this linear transformation, you get a vector right, out. And that's that's actually a, the sort of linear vector field that we looked at before. We looked at those examples previously. A slight variation on the example of the, of the linear uh, vector fields is the uh, affine transformations. An affine transformation is an, a transformation that takes a vector to, um, let's say, a x plus b. Uh, well, A is a linear uh, transformation, an invertible linear transformation for us because we're interested in invertible affine transformations. And this is a translation by a vector, by a constant vector. So once we pick a constant n by n matrix little a and a constant vector b, we'll move every vector according to this. That's called an affine transformation. Um, so, uh, so the group of affine transformations, G is, well, let's say G is the set of all affine transformations, uh, and it's of course a group. Right? It's all transformations of this form for any choice of invertible matrix A and any choice of constant vector B. So that's the affine group. Now um, it's a bit abstract because it's a group of transformations of space of, of it's a, after all it's acting on here the X is in Kn. So our manifold M is uh, is again uh, in uh, n-dimensional vectors, but we're not just doing linear transformations on them, we're also doing translations. Um, to fit this into the mold of our previous example, it's convenient to note that these these transformations as a group, when you actually multiply one by another, you can uh, compose affine transformations. They actually uh, compose according to a rule that says that this affine transformation can be associated with this matrix. Um, it's convenient, in other words, to associate to each affine transformation, like this one, so to take the affine transformation x goes to ax plus b, that transformation and associate to it uh, this matrix. And then you can check that that's a group morphism, a morphism of Lie groups um, to, to the n by n matrices. And that makes it possible to calculate out the, um, the, uh, the, the Lie algebra and the, the, uh, the, the, Lie algebra, the, the action of, of each of the, the vector fields. Um, so let's see how that looks. So first of all, the, 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 the obvious uh, Lie algebra should just be, if you take these affine transformations and you differentiate them as you pass through the identity, A can become approximated by any, like can be perturbed away from the identity plus any small linear transformation, and B can be uh, perturbed away from zero by any vector. So the, the Lie algebra should consist of the, of the transformations that are transformations, say, AX plus B for any um, matrix A and vector B. So um, 
So in other words, little a would be identity plus t times big A. Little b would, ident would be zero plus t times big B would give us uh, a path through the identity transformation. But to make that a little bit less abstract, we can say that we can associate to each such transformation like this. So this is in the group G. This is in the Lie algebra, little g. Um, these transformations can be can have associated to the matrices that look like that. You can see that this matrix, uh, when you have a family of matrices that look like this, you differentiate it. Zero is constant, so it's derivative of zero. One is constant, so it's derivative of zero. And so these are the, the vectors that you expect as the tangent vectors of the identity of this group. So this is what the Lie algebra looks like. So we can abstractly treat our transformations as being transformations that look like um, actual um, expressions of how, how a vector is transformed like this, but we could write them maybe in a slightly more concrete description as matrices. And these uh, transformations that represent our, our Lie algebra acting on vectors can be represented as matrices like this. Um, it enables us to calculate out the, um, the, the uh, uh, derivatives of, uh, so to speak, of these transformations are just obviously just looking at this description here. They're they're given by the vector fields. Um, let's say if we write it as a zero zero zero, the vector field associated to this to this element of our Lie algebra acting at a point x should be according to just looking at this picture here. It's just a x, and then the um, this matrix. If you put just a b into it, and you want to find the associated vector field. Um, on on the, on Kn, um, it's just going to be the vector field that's given by a constant b. So this associates to every point x a vector b. This associates to every point x a vector ax, and that gives us the the um, explicit expressions for the for how the um, the Lie algebra uh, acts on uh, on on the manifold, where the manifold here is just again Kn, and the Lie algebra is this collection of transformations. In, in some sense, since all of our examples really are somehow subgroups of the general linear group, they, uh, there isn't really anything new to be done um, as far as examples. But we might as well take a look at, at the, the rotations because I think it's a very uh, explicit and clear case where we can calculate everything out. We remember that we had um, the group SO3 had Lie algebra, sometimes written as something like little SO3, which consisted of all the matrices that looked like um, like this, it was convenient to adopt a, a clever notation in which uh, the entries were written as ABCs, but in with these with this pattern of signs here, if you write such a such a, a, a matrix, uh, we can identify that matrix. That, that matrix A is identified with a vector V, which is just ABC. That identifies um, the Lie algebra with three-dimensional Euclidean space. And it turned out to identify the bracket in the Lie algebra with the cross product in three-dimensional Euclidean space. And so we can see that if we have um, the, the vector field um, should act by uh, the infinitesimal action ddt at t equals 0, e to the ta x. And if you just expand out what that is, that should just be, uh, because we said that it is a linear uh, vector field, um, this is actually an action of linear transformations, right? This is a group of linear transformations. And so for any group of linear transformations, this is after all contained in the three by three real linear you know, matrices. So three dimensional linear transformations, um, rotations are among those. And so the derivative must be exactly as it was for the general linear group, which was just this guy. But this guy is just V cross X. So what we end up with is a description of our Lie algebra as 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 three dimensional space and um of our uh our um action of uh, each vector field being this guy so um being just a cross product with a constant vector v so this is the angular velocity um we pick an angular velocity vector v and we construct a, a vector field in all of three dimensional space by uh associating to each point x the vector v cross x um, so that gives us a very explicit expression for how to create a rotation with a given angular velocity. Um, and we should think of it that the angular velocity is somehow something like an element, not 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 a vector, but really more like an abstract Lie algebra um, uh, and entry, this vector v. Um, so in particular, if we wanted to write those out, um, be even more concrete, we could say that we could take 
um, the vector v to be e1, um, e2, or e3, the standard basis vectors, and see what we get. Um, we get e1 cross x um, is uh, the associates to each point the vector to each point x in Euclidean three dimensional space, a vector uh, 0 minus x3, x2. Here, maybe I should say that we're looking at a point x, which is some x1, x2, x3 in three dimensional space, and at every point x, we associate this vector. So that's our vector field written out explicitly. At this point x, it gives you this vector. And similarly, uh, we can do e2 cross x is uh, x3, 0, minus x1, and e3 uh, cross x is um, minus x2, x1, 0. Okay. We could write this in our, in our notation using our uh, fancy differential operators as minus x3 d d x uh, x two I don't want to write them I want to write them down instead of up uh, at the moment um, uh, x two doesn't really matter uh, d d x three this one is x three in the one position so it's x three d d x one minus x one in the three position and this one is minus x two d d x one uh, plus x one d, d, x, 2. So we've written out very explicitly what the vector fields are that are generating the uh, action of rotations on three-dimensional Euclidean space uh, associated to the vectors e1, d2, e3. We have vector fields which rotate around e1, around e2, and around e3, um, fixing. This one fixes e1, this one fixes e2, this fixes e3. Um, so it gives us rotations by those as their angular velocities. And all the rotation vector fields are linear combinations of these three vector fields. We know that because our, the algebra of rotations is three-dimensional, and these form a basis. Y you might, in this example, think of the manifold as being three-dimensional space, which is what we did. But you could also uh, think of the manifold as being this two-dimensional sphere, the unit sphere sitting in three-dimensional space. Because when you rotate around the origin, um, you always preserve the unit sphere. So you can think of that as our manifold, if you want. I think of the manifold not as three-dimensional space, but as the sphere. And this is a collection of three vector fields on the sphere. Um, so that makes it maybe a little bit more interesting. Um, now I want to carry out an example where the manifold really is a bit more abstract. Um, since so far this has been just actions of, of linear transformations. Let's think about the theory of linear fractional transformations. Because then we get an abstract manifold, but we can still write out the vector fields of the action more explicitly. So in this example, our group is going to be um, is going to be uh, the group of two by two determinant one matrices. We could use any; don't have to be determinant one. It could be any invertible matrices, um, and it's going to act on our manifold, which is just going to be um, the real projective line. Um, now, what, what do I mean here? What's the action? Well, these are linear transformations with determinant 1. So SL, remember, means that the ter determinant of the transformations is 1. So these are all the 2 by 2 matrices with determinant 1. G is the set of matrices A, B, C, D, such that AD minus BC is 1. So very concretely described object. M is RP1, though. What does that mean? That means the set of, uh, set of all lines. Uh, through the origin in the plane. And um, these linear transformations act taking lines to lines. They take the origin to the origin. And so they act by taking lines through the origin to other lines through the origin. And that's what we're going to try and describe. It's convenient then, as we've done before, to write every line through the origin in the plane as being um, every line through the origin is uh, is somehow uh, spanned by some vector. So we pick a vector that lives in that line. And so we can write um, the line through uh, the origin and some point xy as uh, square brackets xy. That's a very redundant notation, though, because you could pick 
this vector, or you could pick this one, or you could pick this one. Any vectors will give the same line. So many different x, y pairs give the same line. And so it's a notation is, is, is very redundant. So let's think about how this acts, um, how the group acts on the space. Um, the space is these lines, and what's the, what's the group action look like on the lines? Um, well, the group consists of these uh, matrices, A, B, C, D, every element in our group, G, let's say, looks like that, and it acts on, um, on a vector X, Y by the usual A, B, C, D ma ma matrix uh, multiplication times vector, so it's A, X plus B, Y, C, X plus D, Y, just multiplying matrix times vector as usual. But th so uh, so it acts on um, on a line through x y. That's not that's no longer a vector. When I'm putting square brackets, I'm putting that to re represent uh, not a vector, but the whole line through that vector in the origin. So we've got a point x y, but in the same s picture, pick the same point x y. I can make the line through the origin in that point, and that line is going to be called um, bracket x y. Um, so, uh, so this guy, then how does this act on it? Well, it acts on it by acting on the vectors that live in it. So, um, so the linear transformation A, B, C, D acts on the line X, Y by giving me the line that ha contains the resulting vector. Just plug this in. So it transforms vectors to vectors and therefore transforms the line through that vector to the line through this vector. Okay, so it's not very sophisticated. Um, uh, and then uh, we, we have to think about what does it look like in charts. Now, when we first looked at the real projective line a long time ago, uh, we thought about how to construct a chart. There were actually two reasonable choices of chart. One of them was to say that uh, most of the lines have a, have a non-zero value of y. Um, what if y is not zero? Then you can rescale if you rescale a vector, it doesn't change what line it lies in. It lies in the same line to the origin. So what we can do, if you have a non-zero y value, like this vector here, we can always rescale it to make the y value equal to 1. So if it has some y value, we can rescale it to get the y value to be 1. And so uh, we can scale uh, x, y. Uh, we'll scale the vector x, y by 1 over y to get to some vector that looks like x1. And so every line that has a non-zero y value in its vectors, every line that does, in other words, that isn't horizontal, uh, can be rescaled to go through y equals 1. Uh, so, um, so what we get is a, is a story that there's one bad line, which is the horizontal line, which we can't deal with, but all the non-horizontal lines, we can rescale and figure out where they pass through uh, y equals 1 and they pass through y equals 1 at some point, x1, and so the line um, uh, can be written as x comma 1. Um, now when we take that, that gives us a chart, as we discovered before, we can chart um, rp1 minus the horizontal line, so it's a set of all lines to the origin. We take out the horizontal line to the origin, um, and we get a bijection by taking x, we have to get a relation to the real numbers, taking x1 to uh, x. And that was one chart. And then we had the other chart, which was rp1 minus the vertical line was identified with the real numbers by taking any line that's, that's not vertical has some non-zero x component. You can rescale it to be 1. And you can take a line with coordinate components x, y, 1y, a line through the vector 1y, and take it to its y value. So that gave us our two charts. Those were two charts. And we computed out the transition map between the two charts. The transition map was simply y is 1 over x, or x is 1 over y. Why is that? Because if I want to go from x1 to 1y, I have to divide off the x. OK, I've got the x component here. I've got to turn it into a 1, I have to divide off by it. That'll make it into a 1. And so dividing off by x uh, takes that to that, and multi uh, dividing off by y takes that to that. And so we rescale by those factors to get from this description of a line to this one. So that's the transition map. It's defined on all the lines that are, uh, ni that are neither horizontal nor vertical.
Now in this chart, in these charts, we can ask what does the what does the group action actually look like? Let's try and work out the group action in the chart, which is not terribly difficult. Um, we have this chart. Uh, we're looking at a line x1. We associate to the point x. Now we know that this guy transforms under some a, b, c, d uh, to some uh, other point, which is ax plus b, y, y is 1 here, cx plus d, y, y is 1 here. So we compute out what this, uh, this, um, what this transformation does to that vector, and therefore what it does to that line. We put the square brackets around it, turn it into a line, and it produces this. But the operation here um, uh, was given on only on vectors that look like x1. Now how do I make this a 1? This isn't a 1 here, so how do I make it a 1? Well, I can rescale and I get the same line. So a line through the origin doesn't change. If you rescale it by, by its vectors by constants, you get the same line. So let's rescale uh, to make this a 1. We'll rescale by its reciprocal. So we'll get ax plus b over cx plus d and 1. We've rescaled to make that a 1 by dividing by the whole vector by it. The, 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 new, the two um, components of the vector are both divided by the same quantity, so they become a uh, vector point in the same direction. And so we get this guy here. And so this guy maps to everything in the form x1 maps to x. So this 1 maps to ax plus b over cx plus d. So that's the action on the, on the real number line. The action of our group, this is in our group, acts on vectors, uh, on lines like this, and this uh, description of it, uh, it's acting like this on lines. And then we can ask what happens to, in the chart, well, we just follow, apply the chart to those guys and see that that's what the action looks like here. There, you have to be a bit careful. Um, th this is, uh, there's a danger here that um, maybe this isn't well defined. Why might it not well be well defined? Well, our chart isn't defined everywhere. We said that this chart was defined for all the lines that were not uh, not horizontal. Um, uh, now it's possible that this transformation will take a line that's not horizontal to a line that is horizontal, or vice versa. So this transformation may actually be badly behaved, and it's badly behaved where um, uh, where cx plus d is zero. Uh, we have to be careful that this transformation isn't defined. The transformations of this group are defined on the plane, and they're defined, they preserve lines in the plane, so they're defined on every line. So this transformation, it makes perfect sense to apply to any line on the plane. It's perfectly globally defined as, a, as an action of G on M, where G is, of course, our SL2R, and M is, of course, our RP1. This is a well-defined, smooth, globally defined action. Everything's fine. But when you take a chart, it may push you out of the chart. The group may act in such a way that it moves you away from the chart. And that's what's happening here. When you divide by zero in this expression, you're actually moving to a point that's not in this chart. It's in the other chart, because the two charts cover the whole manifold. So you could check that if cx plus d turned out to be zero, well, then its reciprocal of this expression would be fine. Remember, y is 1 over x. If you use the other chart, y is 1 over x, then this expression becomes a c of 1 over y plus d divided by a 1 over y plus b, which you could simplify. And you could see that this would be the action in the other chart. So you have a, your action of your group written in this chart and written in this chart. And it's either defined in one or the other. Um, it's, it's not necessarily defined in this one. But if it is, fails to be defined in this one, then it's defined in that one. And you could check that to be sure. But we know abstractly that must be the case, because the global action is globally defined on the globally defined manifold. Now we can take a look at the Lie algebra of our group. Our group uh, G consists of matrices A, B, C, D with determinant equal to 1. And we've said before, and left as an exercise to prove, that if you have such a matrix and you differentiate it, you get something with trace 0. When you differentiate um, a family of matrices like this, as they pass through the identity matrix, their velocity is given by a matrix of uh, similar size with trace equal to 0. And so we'll just write it, maybe using the same letters, although maybe these should be written as something like velocities of these, maybe a dot, b dot, c dot, d dot, or something like that, to indicate that we're imagining that we take a matrix like this, always having determinant 1, and at the instant that it passes through the identity, we're calculating its velocity, and that's supposed to be this matrix here. Unfortunately, I've used the same letters for both, but you get the idea. These are the velocity ma uh, vectors of these guys. Now, um,
We want to ask, what does this look like as a Lie algebra action? Well, uh, it has to have trace 0. Trace 0 just means exactly that it must have the, that a plus d is 0. And that means d is minus a, so it looks like a, b, c, minus a. And so I'm going to write that in, in the following basis. I'm going to, this is the very traditional basis for the very traditional notation. It's usually written this way. Capital X is, the, is this matrix. Capital Y is... Uh, this one, uh, and uh, capital H, always called H, is this one. Okay, so those three matrices all belong to X, Y, and H, all belong to this G, and they're a basis. They're a basis for the matrices that look like that. Uh, every matrix looks like this has an H component, A, H, it has B, X, and C, Y. So that's how we can expand them into a, into um, uh, a basis for this the algebra. Um, we can exp exponentiate them explicitly, it turns out. It's very easy. It turns out e to the tx, I won't check it for you. You can exp exp put it into the Taylor series of the exponential function and check and see what comes out. And you get uh, this guy. Uh, if you exponentiate y, you get, just take the transpose and you get, obviously, this guy. And if you exponentiate the h, it's a little bit trickier, um, you get e to the t, 0, 0, e to the minus t. So we can see explicitly how these, these come out as exponentials. We can then differentiate them. Well, let's just see what they do in our chart. e to the t capital X in the chart. In our chart, we know we have a formula. Maybe we've lost it a bit. We have a formula up here for how the action, let's go way back here, and find the formula for how the action acts in a chart. And now we can take that action and apply it to a particular uh, little x and see what happens. So in a chart, in our x little x chart, this guy, I can leave you to check, just plug into the formula above, and you get that this guy is simply x plus t. e to the ty, little x, in the little x chart, I'll leave you to check, is um, x divided by tx plus 1 and then e to the th, little x, is, uh, I'll leave you to check, it's e to the 2tx. Okay, so it's not hard to plug into the formula. These matrices, the formula for how anything acts, this is how these things act in the x chart, in the little x chart, um, they act like that. That means I can differentiate them. I can immediately differentiate these three formulas with regard to the t variable and discover what vector fields these represent, this guy then has to be associated uh, to the vector. They differentiate uh, in t and set t equals 0. This guy is just becoming 1. In other words, it's the vector field, which is at each point x, is just uh, uh, ddx. It's the vector field of translation in the x variable, because this is a translation of x by an amount t. Uh, it translates all the x's, all the values of x by an amount t. And so it's when you differentiate, it's given by the translation vector field. Um, this one is much more complicated to differentiate and set to zero. I'll leave you to check that uh, the resulting vector field, when you differentiate in t and send t to zero, um, you get a velocity which is given by minus x squared ddx, a velocity of minus x squared. You don't really need the ddx since it's one-dimensional. We're on the real number line. It's really a number. The velocity is, can be thought of as a number, but we'll write it in our vector field notation. So that's this guy. And, um, oh, sorry, minus, this should be minus. If that's not very well written. Okay, um, so it's minus x squared. And then finally, the h vector field uh, in this chart. You can write it out explicitly, and you get that it's uh, 2x uh, ddx in our notation. So I'll leave you to differentiate these exp expressions and check that you get these three expressions. And you can see what that represents intuitively. This has um, a, a constant times uh, ddx. This has an x squared times ddx minus x squared ddx. This has 2x. So there's a constant linear and quadratic. And so what we find is that g is identified with a set of quadratic vector fields. So that is to say, um, uh, so something plus something x plus something x squared uh, ddx. Um, and you can check that um, if you change x's to y's, we said we could change charts. We had little x um, 
uh, went to little y is 1 over little x as our change of chart. So that's our transition map between the charts. If you check, check the, you plug into this thing, what's a bit of a surprise is that quadratic vector fields actually become quadratic vector fields under this nonlinear transformation. It's not obvious, certainly not obvious, not something I would have guessed. Um, I would have thought the one overs would come up with a lot of mess here, but it doesn't turn out to happen. It turns out that very neatly these vector fields become the same vector fields in the y's. They, they, um, they are quadratic in the x's, but they're also quadratic in the one over x's. And that's rather surprising. So, um, so these are the vector fields that represent our Lie algebra action. So there's an explicit example computed out. Uh, a non-trivial manifold. Our manifold was um, R P one. It's not trivial. It has a. It has two charts. You need two charts to cover it. It's not um, not just covered by a single chart. But in one chart, in the X chart, we calculated out our vector fields of our action. It can turn out to be these guys, and then the other chart, they turn out to be the same guys. The A's, B's, and C's get scrambled up in some um, complicated way, but they're the same, essentially the same sort of vector fields. So we can see explicitly in a chart what are uh, the vector fields of our Lie algebra action associated to the new transformations. And this is, uh, when you go right back to it, it's just about we're taking linear transformations of the plane. We're tr asking how they act on lines to the origin. And we've discovered that some non-trivial fact that this uh, that this class of vector fields is the class of vector fields that arises in our chart that describes how linear transformations act on lines through the origin in the plane. So it's a, it's it's surprising that there's an answer coming out that you can calculate, but that isn't immediately obvious. Right. So now we have this idea that um, we could. Uh, sometimes uh, differentiate a Lie group action, come up with, a, with, a, with an action of its Lie algebra as vector fields, a description of its Lie algebra as vector fields. Um, this leads us right away into the idea that maybe we should look at Lie algebras themselves acting on their own without their Lie groups. And to do that, we have to define what we mean by a, a Lie algebra without a group. So, um, so we're interested now in Lie algebras, um, but not necessarily of Lie groups viewed abstractly. This is a, is a good move to make very often in mathematics to find something that comes up over and over again and make an abstract definition of it. A Lie algebra. So far the term Lie algebra for us always meant the Lie algebra of a Lie group. Let's define an abstract Lie algebra. Is a vector space. For us it'll always be finite dimensional, G, um, and it'll always be real. Um, equipped with with a uh, bilinear um, anti-symmetric operation, anti-symmetric operation, operation, um, which should which we write as uh, taking ele abstract elements in the vector space. I'll write them with little letters instead of my. So far, I've been writing capital A, capital B. Now there'll be little x, little y. Um, it's more common when we think of them as an abstract Lie algebra to write them in that small letter notation. So it's going to be something that takes this guy to this guy. I'll sometimes write the little comma between the two, especially when it's needed to figure out which one is which. But in this case, it's obvious one of them's x, one of them's y. So do need the comma. Um, uh, so this guy should be in the Lie algebra. So a Lie algebra has has uh, is a any vector space equipped with any operation that's anti-symmetric, so you swap the x and the y, you change the sign, and um, has to be bilinear, so it's linear in x and linear in y. Since it's a vector space, that makes sense. Um, uh, so that there's one more feature, which is not at all obvious. This is a rather sneaky um, way of bringing in this issue. If we uh, let add sub x mean the linear operation add sub x y is defined simply to be x y. Okay, so that's that means that add x is an operation e sub vector y and brackets it against x. So that's a linear operation. Um, that's a linear operator. Then uh, we'll require the following rather uh, surprising uh, extra condition. Add x, add y has to be equal to add x y for any x and y. This is called the Jacobi identity, and we haven't come across it so far. It's a new new discovery for us. I don't want to put a lot of time and effort into the Jacobi identity because it is really long and complicated and messy. Um, but what we're saying here is that you take this bracket inside the Lie algebra G, uh, 
It comes equipped with this bilinear operation that we'll call a bracket. It has this thing. And when you calculate bracket and then take add, it's the same as if you take add first of each of them and then take a bracket. What's this bracket? This is not in G anymore. This is the bracket of linear transformations. These are each linear transformation of, 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 the, of our vector space G, uh, German G, and that's their bracket as, as a linear transformation. Um, you can write this out in a different way. I think this way of writing it is, is somewhat intuitive that it says that the bracket uh, respects um, somehow the, the taking of add, um, that add uh, is, 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 is happy to, to deal well with brackets. Um, but you can rewrite it as, um, let's just rewrite that identity by plugging some vector z in here, here, and here. You can rewrite it out. I won't do the, the, the algebra for you. It simply becomes this rather complicated expression that if you bracket, um, if I put a z here, z here, and z here, and expand it all out, you can see that it'll become this, uh, sorry, this expression, the first term there, this becomes this guy plus um, uh, z, x, y, and then plus, finally, uh, y, x, z. Okay, so I guess this one is from here, this guy is sitting here, and then this expression is the other the other two terms. Um, so we can rewrite this as this horrible identity. And again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on Jacobi identity because it's not very intuitive and it's very, very complicated. Um, but uh, we'll just say a few words about it. Um, why do I want that? Because it turns out that's satisfied on any on any Lie group. Um, so if we have a Lie group, it has a Lie algebra. Um, so if we, so here's an example, if we had a Lie group, it have a Lie algebra, which is uh, defined to be its tangent space at the identity element. And then it turns out it has this. This holds, um, which I won't prove. Um, it's proven, I think, in the notes. Um, it does turn out to have this horrendous identity. Um, um, in fact, there's a, there's a more general example, in some sense. A more general example is that if M is a manifold, um, and if we take x, y, and z to be any vector fields on this on that manifold, then in fact this ha this is satisfied with capital letters instead of small letters. Um, it is satisfied by any vector fields, and that fact tells us that it must be satisfied on in this previous example on any Lie group because we define the bracket on a Lie group as the bracket of vector fields of left invariant vector fields. So it must be satisfied on any Lie group. Um, so that's uh, why, where this horrendous identity somehow comes from. I, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have noticed it, but it is, as it turns out, uh, this is vital a vital identity that we need to get a good theory going for abstractly algebras because it's already satisfied for vector fields on manifolds. Um, in fact, there's one more uh, interesting class of, of examples. If you uh, take, let's say, script A to be any uh, associative algebra. I won't worry about what that means. Um, I'll assume you've taken enough algebra to know what an associative algebra is over whatever over any field. Um, then, uh, then in fact, um, if you define in it, in that associative algebra, you define the bracket of two elements to be simply their product in the algebra. So it's an algebra that has a, a multiplication operation. So we use the multiplication of the algebra, but then we do it the other way around. Um, take the difference, and you define that as your bracket, then um, that will satisfy this horrible Jacobi identity. Um, so that gives us, us three classes of examples. In fact, as I said, the second example of manifolds and vector fields implies the, fir the, the first one because this is a manifold, and the bracket that we came up with was the bracket of left invariant vector fields. So it's, it's true for any vector fields, but it's also true for any associative algebra. I'm not going to prove any of that because it isn't very interesting. Um, so, but it gives us something to, to, uh, to think about. It gives us a nice definition of what should be an abstract, um, an abstract uh, Lie algebra. So, um, and, and then we have the obvious notion of, an, of a Lie algebra morphism. That's just a morphism of algebras. It's now an algebra because it has this bracket operation, which you can think of as a multiplication for an algebra. And so, uh, so a morphism of, of Lie algebras uh, is just obviously a linear map that takes brackets to brackets. Um, so I won't worry about that too much. We won't have a lot of examples of some examples of those. Um, and uh, an action 
uh, of an abstract Lie algebra. So now we don't have a group, we just have this, somehow we have this strange beast, this finite dimensional vector space with some kind of abstract bracket operation. Think of, for example, three-dimensional Euclidean space as a cross product, and we found it came up in this way. Um, so we have this, um, given this uh, Lie algebra, say we want to get an action of it on a manifold, what is that? That means that uh, it's a linear map uh, which associates to any element of the abstract Lie algebra a uh, vector field uh, on M so that the brackets match almost perfectly um, but with a minus sign. This is frustrating, the minus sign, but we saw this previously that that came up when we did, uh, when we had, to have, had Lie algebra actions. We looked at how Lie algebras act. Uh, it came up already with, with right invariant vector fields that they have the opposite sign from left invariant vector fields. So there's no escaping. There's going to be a minus sign somewhere in the theory, and we'll, we've hit into it. Uh, so we just have to live with it. Now, we might wonder um, whether or not there really are any abstract uh, Lie algebras. And so a rather big theorem says that, um, first of all, that every uh, finite dimensional, all, all of everything we're doing is finite dimensional. So for us, Lie algebra means finite dimensional. Every Lie algebra um, G is a Lie subalgebra of um, the uh, n by n matrices, uh, sorry, n by n matrices for some n. Okay, so well, even just let's say R n by n matrices, where we use usual bracket of matrices, the usual matrix, yeah, that's not very readable. Um, let's say R n by n, um, uh, which is often written in this subject, of course, is uh, German uh, script G L n R. Um, it's the with the usual bracket being the usual um, bracket is just matrix multiply in one order minus the other order as usual. So all the Lie algebras are actually not so abstract. They're, they're rather concrete. This is a theorem due to Addo. And it has the immediate consequence, which we'll see later, that um, we, we won't pr we'll never prove Addo because it's actually quite hard. Um, uh, so, um, so we won't prove that. But it does have the, the nice consequence uh, that, in fact, um, every um, Lie algebra, every abstract Lie algebra is the Lie algebra of um, of a Lie group. So, in fact, the abstract theory doesn't really get us so far away from the concrete theory, the more concrete theory of of Lie groups. Um, it's not really all that abstract after all. So we won't actually prove a dose theorem, but we will give, use it as a kind of um, motivation for, for allowing ourselves to introduce this kind of thing. And there's a, a related result, which we won't quite prove either, um, the theorem of Dick Palais, that says that um, every uh, uh, Lie algebra action um, by, here's the tricky issue, complete vector fields. Remember, those are ones that have flows for all time um, by complete vector fields arises from a Lie group action. And of course, the opposite is true. If it has a Lie, a Lie group action, then obviously the, the vector fields are complete. Um, uh, so, um, so we can determine which Lie algebra actions arise from, from, from Lie group actions. As an example, um, we go back to our simple case of the quadratic vector fields. We said if we had a plus bx plus cx squared uh, d dx, the set of all those is an is a is a Lie algebra uh, such that a, b, and c are any can be any real constants. You take those real constants and stick them in here, and you get a you get a vector field on the real number line. Right? This is on the real number line. So here our manifold is now the real number line. We have this class of vector fields, but you can check that this vector field is not complete. Uh, you can check that in finite time you can go away with this vector field. Um, it's not hard to check. It actually takes you away to infinity in finite time, so it's not complete. So that's really where we begin to see that there's a problem. Uh, this is this is not complete, so it doesn't arise from a Lie group action. But that's not surprising since, after all, we we actually arrived at these vector fields acting on RP1, and we're saying that when we charted, when we took RP1 minus the horizontal line, 
and we took it as a chart to R, we came up with these vector fields. But when on R, that isn't really a group action because the, because the group action sort of flows off to uh, to other parts of RP1. It flows off to that horizontal line in finite time. So you can see the action is really an action on RP1. But this, this description of quadratic vector fields and of linear fractional transformations on the real number line occurs going back quite far into the 19th century before anyone had really described RP1. And the people working with these things were aware that you could flow to infinity and that you could flow from infinity and that you should sort of, in some sense, allow infinity into the game. You had to allow this abstract manifold to, um, to include a point at infinity together with the real numbers to be able to get this class of vector fields to behave as a group action. And as our next step, we want to think about, um, about the actions of, um, of, of Lie groups on manifolds and Lie algebras on manifolds more generally. And we, we're going to need to think about how they would act if they were, um, say, acting on some manifold with some sort of orbits that behaved in some nice way. Um, we, we end up sort of slicing up the manifold into the orbits. And so we're interested in slicing up manifolds. Um, uh, how do we slice them up into little slices? And that's what we're going to try to do next time, to think about a kind of salami picture of a manifold.